Never try to teach a pig to sing. It'll waste your time, and it annoys the pig. This is often attributed to Mark Twain. He was a great American author and humorist. He's also well known for his quips and quotes. He had one I really like. If you always tell the truth, you don't have to remember anything. He has another one that's pretty good. Clothes make the man. Naked people have very little influence on society. <laughs> so most of the time when Mark Twain says something, you get it. You understand what he's trying to say. But this one's troubled me. I heard this for the first time over 20 years ago. I worked for a man who said it all the time. Never try to teach a pig to sing. But what does it mean exactly? So I thought about it. Does it mean that we should never acquire new skills because we are who we are and that's all there is? Or does it mean that we shouldn't take risk and experiment because you're born with a natural set of skills and that's all you can do? Maybe it means for teachers, you're wasting your time. You can't teach people things. They're just who they are. But I don't think that's what it means. I actually think it's an admonition to us to be careful because as humans, we almost always look for negatives, what people can't do, what their limits are, what their weaknesses are. We judge people instead of think about their possibilities, what could happen, what's their potential, what were they meant to do that they don't even know yet. I think this is a warning to us to not fall in the trap. Don't try to teach a pig to sing. Let's in fact look for what the pig can do. Let's Find what people are great at, what motivates them, where their passions lie. And let's encourage that. Let's celebrate what people do that makes them great. Let's celebrate what we want to see more of. Now, from my perspective, one of the things I knew when I came here was that I would have something in common with a lot of you, which is horses. I love horses. A lot of times in my daily conversation, I'll talk to people and I'll mention something about a horse. I'll use a horse as an example. And invariably, they'll say, oh, do you ride? And I'll say, yes, I was born on a horse. Now, my mom always disagreed with that. I wasn't really born on a horse. But as you can see, I was attached to one very early. I learned to ride before I could walk. Horses helped me be fearless. They gave me independence. When you live way out in the country on a dirt road, a horse's wheels. You were able to do things because I had a horse that I couldn't do without them. I also learned to take care of something that needed my help. Horses were a great education for me. They also made me tough. I learned to ride barefoot and bareback, even in a dress. I learned to compete on a horse, sometimes winning and sometimes losing, but always in a partnership with my horse. I worked out a lot of things in my head and in my life, hanging out with horses. But even though I love them very much, I know they have limits. You know, horses are pretty finicky. They have teeth problems. They have stomach problems. They have feet problems. They can die very quickly. I've always been amazed they can actually get hurt in a padded cell. I don't know how a horse can get hurt so easily. You know, horses are flight animals. They're like gazelles or zebras. They live in herds. They look because everything that moves outside of them is going to eat them. When horses are afraid, they're very dangerous. And I think that it's impossible sometimes to think about a horse except through its limitations. So maybe we could rewrite the saying, never try to teach a horse to roller skate. The thing is, they can. <laughs> now, throughout all of junior high and high school, this was my best friend. And I mean the woman, not the horse. <laughs> Kathy... And her husband, she married a professional rodeo clown. And they toured the U.S. with a whole host of animals. And then they joined a one-ring circus and toured the world. And all of their animals did amazing things, things that were t completely unexpected. And I always wonder, how do you teach a horse to roller skate? Well, clearly this horse is special. I don't think every horse can roller skate. This horse had a special mental attitude, a toughness. It had a willingness to learn. It had good physical and mental capabilities for the task at hand. There's a common teaching method with horses. It's called pressure and release. And that teaching method, if employed, can teach horses to do a lot of things. You probably use it here. 
If you want a horse to turn to the right, you pull the rein. And a horse might resist, but you don't jerk, try to hurt its mouth. You wait. And when the horse gives, you release. And what you're saying to that horse is, that's exactly what I wanted. Do that again. And if you're patient and you practice and you're persistent and consistent, eventually you can just move your pinky and that horse will give its head. Now, I've seen other ways of trying to train horses that weren't so good. I've seen people use spurs and whips and force horses into positions even though they were very fearful. I've also seen people and horses get hurt by using negative reinforcement. I think in all of our situations, we ought to try the opportunity to think about positive coaching with a horse. Positive coaching helps them live up to their potential, whether it's roller skating or some other skill. Thoroughbreds are designed to run because they have huge nostrils and big lungs. They can put more oxygen into their heart to power their distance. Quarter horses, on the other hand, are quick and fast. They've been clocked at 55 miles an hour. That's why we use them for calf roping and for barrel racing and keyhole. We use them for what they're best at. And if we work with a horse positively, they can do amazing things. I'd like to think that we could do that at work as well. All of you as students at Thatcher have a job. People expect things of you. You're supposed to get up and be on time. Maybe I'll say that again. You're supposed to get up and be on time. You're supposed to be prepared. You're supposed to both listen and participate in the classroom. And if your parents get to vote, you're supposed to make good grades, graduate, go to college, and repeat. It's a pretty important job. Everybody else in this room has a job as well. We all have a role to play. I'd like to think that at work, we'd get the same kind of positive reinforcement, pressure and release when we do what's good and on behalf of the business. Unfortunately, in the business world, that's not always true. A lot of feedback is negative. You don't have very good analytical skills. That presentation was not done well. Your peers don't think you're a good team player on the project. It's a lot of pressure to get negative feedback, and it doesn't help us know what to do. If that's what feedback's about, who wants it? But I'm a very strong believer in feedback. I think both giving and receiving feedback is important. Giving feedback means you're giving a gift to someone. You're saying to them, you're important to me. I care about your success. I'm investing in you as an individual because I know you're worth it. You have potential, and I know you want to get better. Giving feedback can be hard. Receiving it sometimes can be harder. I was very young when I first had the opportunity to be the CEO of a company. I was 37, and I was asked to run the world's largest angioplasty company. I can tell you I had no idea what I was doing, and it really wasn't smart to put me in that job at that point. Someone took a risk on me. I didn't know the industry, the customers, the products. I'd never even seen an angioplasty procedure. I knew that I needed a lot of feedback so that I could learn and grow to help the company be successful. But a funny thing happens when there's CEO written on your business card. People don't want to tell you anything. They don't want to say anything nice to you. Hey, Ginger, way to go. Because they think you think they're brown nosing. People don't want to say anything bad to you because they think you'll fire them. So imagine living in a world where you don't get positive feedback and you don't get negative feedback. How can you possibly get better? So I wanted to start a culture at this company where everyone was not just expected to give and receive feedback, they were required to do so. We owed it to each other. And we used a simple framework. It was called start, stop, and continue. So I think Ms. McMahon is in the office to, uh, audience tonight, and I've asked her if I could use her as an example. So imagine that your dean of students, Ms. McMahon, is in a meeting, and she's worked hard for this meeting, she's studied, she's prepared, she knows a lot about this topic, and she feels very passionate and wants to contribute. But in the meeting, she interrupts other people. She won't let them finish their sentences. She feels so compelled to say what she thinks that she doesn't wait to hear what other people think. Now, if I'm in the meeting and we walk out together, I might ask her, Miss McMahon, can I give you feedback? 
And hopefully she would say, yes, please do. And so what I would say to her is, in future meetings, in order for you to be more effective, I think you need to start listening to people all the way through their ideas without thinking about what you want to say next so that they really can finish their thought. We might learn something. In addition, you need to stop interrupting people when they're talking. They won't want to work with you anymore because they'll feel like you don't respect their opinions and you're not taking in what they care about and have to say. But I know you worked really hard, and you know a lot, and you care deeply, and I feel like you're doing the right thing. So please continue doing that. But in the future, just do a small thing. Let someone else finish their sentence and don't interrupt. Now, if I said that to Ms. McMahon, what I would hope she would say back to me is, thank you for the feedback. It's really hard to do. We're all afraid to give and receive feedback. But hopefully, what I did was say to her, you've got a lot going for you. I'm not asking you to be somebody different, just a small tweak in your performance. Be sure to be a good listener and don't interrupt, and you'll be so much more effective. My sister-in-law is a teacher. She's an English teacher for fourth and fifth grade students, and she's a great teacher. She loves her students, and her students love her. And she tells the story about when she was just out of college in her early 20s as a teacher. She had a principal named Mr. Beckloff, and Mr. Beckloff was very dedicated to his teaching staff. He made it a point to go to every classroom on a regular basis and then sometimes drop in unannounced. When he was there, he would take notes, and every time he would ask to meet with them afterwards and give them feedback. Debbie said at the beginning of every meeting when he gave her feedback, he said, Debbie, you are a master English teacher. And then he would go to point out specific things that she did during class that she did well. You did such a good job of helping your students use good grammar in the classroom. The way you teach punctuation is really interesting. The kids seem to love it. You're going to have a great impact on their lives. Debbie said that at that point, she was open to any feedback because she felt appreciated. Of course, her thought was just like all of us. The first thing she went, Shh, I'm not going to get fired. And don't we all think that about ourselves, that we're going to fail? And Mr. Beckloff said, you're doing great. The second thing, she was happy because it recognized how hard she was working to do a good job. But the third thing really struck me. She said, I felt obligated to live up to his expectations of me. I wanted to become a master English teacher. Feedback can be positive. Feedback can be helpful. We owe it to each other to find the best in each other. I think if we celebrate more of what we want to see, people will respond positively because we all want to do well. This is even something you can take into your personal life. It's not just at work or just with a horse. All of us judge each other. Why do we find a way in our families to see the worst, to say the negative, to be critical and harsh with each other? I always give my older brother a really hard time. We're only two years apart. He's got a PhD and went on to do great things and raise a terrific family, so I like to make him feel guilty now because he's my older brother. When we were little kids, he would always say to me, what would you do with the money mom gave you? And I'd say, what money? And he'd say, the money she gave you for singing lessons. Now, that's what older brothers do, right? But in fact, I love to sing, but it's not my strong suit. If I could be Taylor Swift, I would be. Believe me, I'd trade places in a nanosecond. I'd be singing this talk instead of speaking, but I'm not. Remember Kathy that I showed you with the horse that had roller skates on? Kathy and I lived on horses. We rodeoed together, we horse showed together, we trail rode together, we slept over, we studied together, we were inseparable. We were going to go to vet school together, be veterinarians, and save the world together. Well, as I mentioned, Kathy got married and traveled the world with roller skating horses. I did go on to vet school. I put a lot of pressure on my family because I had to go out of state. My brother and I are both first-generation college education. It was a big deal to my family, and we really didn't have the money for both of us to go to school forever, 
but we did. I was going to be a vet because I had been born on a horse, and I loved horses, and it was all that mattered to me. But after I did my pre-vet program, and then I went and worked for a vet for a year, I found out I didn't want to be a vet. It was a really difficult time for me. I thought I had failed. I was embarrassed because for 20 years I had told every person I knew I was going to be a vet. Now what was I going to be? I felt bad about my family because out-of-state is really expensive, and I put a lot of pressure on them to afford for me to go out-of-state to vet school. It was a hard time for me because I didn't know what was next. So I'm not a singer, I'm not Taylor Swift, and I'm not a vet, but I was given other gifts in life, and I've built other skills, mostly because people helped me. I got good feedback and good coaching. People invested in me and spent time with me. People cared about my progress and encouraged me to take risks, to take jobs I didn't know how to do, to try things I'd never tried before so that I could find how I could sing in my own life. My mom had this crazy saying because she was always encouraging me to try, to take a risk, to go for it. It was a great gift that I got from her, but she had this saying. She'd say, what's the worst that could happen? And I'm telling you, I knew I might die. I'd be embarrassed. I'd be mortified. Everyone would make fun of me. I'd be on YouTube. It would be horrible. I knew the worst that would happen to me. But in her view, it was a simple answer. She would always say, well, they can kill you, but they can't eat you. <laughs> now, I have no idea what that means, but it always made me laugh, too. And it gave me perspective. And then I realized that I could try. And maybe I would find something else that I could do. I think all of us should focus on the positives, on learning new skills, on taking risks, and then for all of us together, try to celebrate what we can do well together. Thanks very much.